The Things They Carried, Chapter One. First Lieutenant Jimmy Cross carried letters from a girl named Martha, a junior at Mount Sebastian College in New Jersey. They were not love letters, but Lieutenant Cross was hoping, so he kept them folded in plastic at the bottom of his rucksack. In the late afternoon, after a day's march, he would dig his foxhole, wash his hands under a canteen, unwrap the letters, hold them with the tips of his fingers, and spend the last hour of light pretending. He would imagine romantic camping trips into the White Mountains in New Hampshire. He would sometimes taste the envelope flaps, knowing her tongue had been there. More than anything, he wanted Martha to love him as he loved her, but the letters were mostly chatty, elusive on the matter of love. She was a virgin, he was almost sure. She was an English major at Mount Sebastian, and she wrote beautifully about her professors and roommates and midterm exams, about her respect for Chaucer and her great affection for Virginia Woolf. She often quoted lines of poetry. She never mentioned the war, except to say, Jimmy, take care of yourself. The letters weighed 10 ounces. They were signed, love, Martha. But Lieutenant Cross understood that love was only a way of signing and did not mean what he sometimes pretended it to mean. At dusk, he would carefully return the letters to his rucksack. Slowly, a bit distracted, he would get up and move among his men, checking his, the perimeter. Then at full dark, he would return to his hole and watch the night and wonder if Martha was a virgin. The things they carried were largely determined by necessity. Among the necessities or near necessities were P38 can openers, pocket knives, heat tabs, wristwatches, dog tags, mosquito repellent, chewing gum, candy, cigarettes, salt tablets, packets of Kool-Aid, lighters, matches, sewing kits, military payment certificates, sea rations, and two or three canteens of water. Together, these items weighed between 15 and 20 pounds, depending upon a man's habit or rate of metabolism. Henry Dobbins, who was a big man, carried extra rations. He was especially fond of canned peaches and heavy syrup over pancake. Dave Jensen, who practiced field hygiene, carried a toothbrush, dental floss, and several hotel-sized bars of soap he'd stolen on r and in Sydney, Australia. Ted Lavender, who was scared, carried tranquilizers until he was shot in the head outside the village of Tan Key in mid-April. By necessity, and because it was SOP, they all carried steel helmets that weighed five pounds, including the liner and camouflage cover. They carried the standard fatigue jackets and trousers. Very few carried underwear. On their feet, they carried jungle boots, 2.1 pounds, and Dave Jensen carried three packs of socks and a can of Dr. Scholl's foot powder as a precaution against trench foot. Until he was shot, Ted Lavender carried six or seven ounces of premium dope, which for him was a necessity. Mitchell Sanders, the RTO, carried condoms. Norman Bowker carried a diary. Rat Kiley carried comic books. Kiowa, a devout Baptist, carried an illustrated New Testament that had been presented to him by his father, who taught Sunday school in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. As a hedge against bad times, however, Kiowa also carried his grandmother's distrust of the white man, his grandfather's old hunt, hunting hatchet. Necessity dictated. Because the land was mined and booby-trapped, it was SOP for each man to carry a steel-centered, nylon-covered flak jacket, which weighed 6.7 pounds, but which on hot days seemed much heavier. Because you could die so quickly, each man carried at least one large compress bandage, usually in the helmet band, for easy access. Because the nights were cold and because the monsoons were wet, each carried a green plastic poncho, poncho that could be used as a raincoat or ground sheet or makeshift tent. With its quilted liner, the poncho weighed almost two pounds, but it was worth every ounce. In April, for instance, when Ted Lavender was shot, they used his poncho to wrap him up, then, carry, then to carry him across the paddy, then to lift him into the chopper that took him away. They were called legs or grunts. To carry something was to hump it, as when Lieutenant Jimmy Cross humped his love for Martha up the hills and through the swamps. In its intransitive form, to hump meant to walk or to march, but it implied burdens far beyond the intransitive. 
almost everyone humped photographs. In his wallet, Lieutenant Cross carried two photographs of Martha. The first was a coat of color snapshot signed love, though he knew better. She stood against a brick wall. Her eyes were gray and neutral, her lips slightly open as she stared straight on at the camera. At night, sometimes Lieutenant Cross wondered who had taken the picture because he knew she had boyfriends, because he loved her so much and because he could see the shadow of the picture taker spreading out against the brick wall. The second photograph had been clipped from the 1968 Mount Sebastian yearbook. It was an action shot, women's volleyball, and Martha was bent horizontal to the floor, reaching the palms of her hands in sharp focus, the tongue taut, the expression frank and competitive. There was no visible sweat. She wore white gym shorts. Her legs, he thought, were almost certainly the legs of a virgin, dry and without hair, the left knee cocked and carrying her entire weight, which was just over 100 pounds. Lieutenant Cross remembered touching that left knee, a dark theater, he remembered, and the movie was Bonnie and Clyde. And Martha wore a tweed skirt, and during the final scene, when he touched her knee, she turned and looked at him in a sad, sober way that made him pull his hand back but he, was always, he would always remember the feel of the tweed skirt and the knee beneath it and the sound of the gunfire that killed Bonnie and Clyde, how embarrassing it was, how slow and oppressive. He remembered kissing her goodnight at the dorm door. Right then he thought he should have done something brave. He should have carried her up the stairs to her room and tied her to the bed and touched that left knee all night long. He should have risked it. Whenever he looked at the photographs, he thought, of new things he should have done. What they carried was partly a function of rank, partly a field specialty. As a first lieutenant and platoon leader, Jimmy Cross carried a compass, maps, code books, binoculars, and a 45 caliber pistol that weighed 2.9 pounds fully loaded. He carried a strobe light and the responsibility for the lives of his men. As an RTO, Mitchell Sanders carried the PRC-25 radio, a killer, 26 pounds with its batteries. As a medic, Rat Kylie carried a canvas satchel filled with morphine and plasma and malaria tablets and surgical tape and comic books and all the things a medic must carry, including M&Ms for especially bad wounds for a total weight of nearly 20 pounds. As a big man, therefore machine gunner, Henry Dobbins carried the M60, which weighed 23 pounds unloaded, but which was almost always loaded. In addition, Dobbins carried between 10 and 15 pounds of ammunition draped in belts across his chest and shoulders. As PFCs or spec fours, most of them were common grunts and carried the standard M16 gas operated assault rifle. The weapon weighed 7.5 pounds unloaded, 8.2 pounds with its full 20 round magazine. Depending on numerous factors such as topography and psychology, the riflemen carried anywhere from 12 to 20 magazines, usually in cloth, cloth bandoliers, adding on another 8.4 pounds at minimum, 14 pounds at maximum. When it was available, they also carried M16 maintenance gear, rods and steel brushes and swabs and tubes of LSA oil, all of which weighed about a pound. Among the grunts, some carried the M79 grenade launcher, 5.9 pounds unloaded, a reasonably light weapon except for the ammunition, which was heavy. A single round weighed 10 ounces. The typical load was 25 rounds. But Ted Lavender, who was scared, carried 34 rounds when he was shot and killed outside Tanki, and he went down under an ex exceptional burden, more than 20 pounds of ammunition, plus the flak jacket and helmet and rations and water and toilet paper and tranquilizers and all the rest, plus the unweighed fear. He was dead weight. There was no twitching or flopping. Kiowa, who saw it happen, said it was like watching a rock fall or a big sandbag or something, just boom, then down. Not like the movies where the dead guy rolls around and does fancy spins and goes ass over tea kettle. Not like that, Kiowa said. The poor bastard just flat fuck fell, boom, down, nothing else. It was a bright morning in mid-April. Lieutenant Cross felt the pain. He blamed himself. They stripped off Lavender's canteens and ammo, all the heavy things, and Rat Kylie said the obvious. The guy's dead. 
and Mitchell Sanders used his radio to report one U.S. KIA and to request, request a chopper. Then they wrapped Lavender in his poncho. They carried him out to a dry paddy, established security, and sat smoking the dead man's dope until the chopper came. Lieutenant Cross kept to himself. He pictured Martha's smooth young face, thinking he loved her more than anything, more than his men, and now Ted Lavender was dead because he loved her so much it could not stop thinking about her. When the dust off arrived, they carried Lavender aboard. Afterward, they, buried, they burned Tan Ki. They marched until dusk, then dug their holes, and that night Kiwa kept explaining how he had to be there, how fast it was, how the poor guy just dropped like so much concrete. Boom, down, he said, like cement. In addition to the standard, three standard weapons, the M60, M16, and M79, they carried whatever presented itself or whatever seemed appropriate as a means of killing or staying alive. They carried catches catch can at various times in various situations. They carried M14s and uh, CAR 15s and Swedish Ks and grease guns and captured AK 47s and Chicoms and RPGs and Simonov carbines and black market Uzis and 38 caliber Smith and Wesson handguns and 66 millimeter LAWs and shotguns and silencers and blackjacks and bayonets and C4 plastic explosives. Lee Strunk carried a slingshot, a weapon of last resort, he called it. Mitchell Sanders carried brass knuckles. Kiwa carried his grandfather's feathered hatchet. Every third or fourth man carried a Claymore anti-personnel -person mine, 3.5 pounds with its firing device. They all carried fragmentation grenades, 14 ounces each. They all carried at least one M18 colored smoke grenade, 24 ounces. Some carried CS or tear gas grenades. Some carried white phosphorus grenades. They carried all they could bear and then some, including a silent awe for the terrible power of the things they carried. In the first week of April before Lavender died, Lieutenant Jimmy Cross received a good luck charm from Martha. It was a simple pebble, an ounce at most. Smooth to the touch, it was a milky white color with flecks of orange and violet, oval shaped like a miniature egg. In the accompanying letter, Martha wrote that she had found the pebble on the Jersey shoreline, precisely where the land touched water at high tide, where things came together, but also separated. It was this separate but together quality, she wrote, that had inspired her to pick up the pebble and carry it in her breast pocket for several days, where it seemed weightless, and then to send it through the mail by air as a token of her truest feelings for him. Lieutenant Cross found this romantic, but he wondered what her truest feelings were exactly and what she meant by separate but together. He wondered how the tides and waves had come into play on that afternoon along the Jersey shoreline when Martha saw the pebble and bent down to rescue it from geology. He imagined bare feet. Martha was a poet and with the poet's sensibilities and her feet would be brown and bare, the toenails unpainted, the eyes chilly and somber like the ocean in March. Though it was painful, he wondered who had been with her that afternoon. He imagined a pair of shadows moving along the strip of sand where things came together, but also separated. It was phantom jealousy, he knew, but he couldn't help himself. He loved her so much. On the march, through the hot days of early April, he carried the pebble in his mouth, turning it with his tongue, tasting sea salt and moisture. His mind wandered. He had difficulty keeping his tension on the war. On occasion, he would yell at his men to spread out the column to keep their eyes open. But then he would slip away into daydreams, just pretending, walking barefoot along the Jersey shore with Martha carrying nothing. He would feel himself rising, sun and waves and gentle winds, all love and lightness. What they carried varied by mission. When a mission took them to the mountains, they carried mosquito netting, machetes, canvas tarps, and extra bug juice. If a mission seemed especially hazardous, or if it involved a place they knew to be bad, they carried everything they could. In certain heavily mined AOs where the land was dense with toe poppers and bouncing beddies, they took turns humping a 28 pound mine detector. With its headphones and big sensing plate, the equipment was a stress on the lower back and shoulders. 
awkward to handle, often useless because of the shrapnel in the earth, but they carried it anyway, partly for safety, partly for the illusion of safety. On ambush or on other night missions, they carried peculiar little odds and ends. Kiowa always took along his New Testament and a pair of moccasins for silence. Dave Jensen carried night sight vitamins high in carotene. Lee Strunk carried his slingshot ammo, he claimed, would never be a problem. Rat Kylie carried brandy and M&M's candy. Until he was shot, Ted Lavender carried the Starlight Scope, which weighed 6.3 pounds with its aluminum carrying case. Henry Dobbins carried his girlfriend's pantyhose wrapped around his neck as a comforter. They all carried ghosts. When dark came, they would move out single file across the meadows and paddies to their ambush coordinates where they would quietly set up the claymores and lie down and spend the night waiting. Other missions were more complicated and required special equipment. In mid-April, it was their mission to search out and destroy the elaborate tunnel complexes in the Tan Key uh, area south of Chulai. To blow the tunnels, they carried one pound blocks of pentrite high explosives for blocks to a man, 68 pounds in all. They carried wiring, detonators, and battery powered clackers. Dave Jensen carried earplugs. More often before blowing the tunnels, they were ordered by higher command to search them, which was considered bad news. But by and large, they just shrugged and carried out orders. Because he was a big man, Henry Dobbins was excused from tunnel duty. The others would draw numbers. Before Ted Lavender died, there were 17 men in the platoon and whoever drew the number 17 would strip off his gear and crawl in head first with a flashlight and Lieutenant Cross's 45 caliber pistol. The rest of them would fan out as security. They would sit down or kneel, not facing the hole, listening to the ground beneath them, imagining cobwebs and ghosts, uh, whatever was down there, the tunnel walls squeezing in, how the flashlight seemed impossibly heavy in the hand and how it was tunnel vision in the very strictest sense, compression in all ways, even time, and how you had to wiggle in ass and elbows, a swallowed up feeling, and how you found yourself worrying about odd things. Will your flashlight go dead? Do rats carry rabies? If you screamed, how far would the sound carry? Would your buddies hear it? Would they have the courage to drag you out? In some respects though, uh, though not many, the waiting was worse than the tunnel itself. Imagination was a killer. On April 16th, when Lee struck, uh, Strunk drew the number 17, he laughed and muttered something and went down quickly. The morning was hot and very still. Not good, Kiowa said. He looked at the tunnel opening then out across a dry paddy toward the village of Tanki. Nothing moved, no clouds or birds or people. As they waited, the men smoked and drank Kool-Aid. Not talking much, feeling sympathy for Lee's trunk, but also feeling the luck of the draw. You win some, you lose some, said Mitchell Sanders. And sometimes you settle for a rain check. It was a tired line and no one laughed. Henry Dobbins ate a tropical chocolate bar. Ted Lavender popped a tranquilizer and went off to pee. After five minutes, Lieutenant Jimmy Cross moved to the tunnel, leaned down and examined the darkness. Trouble, he thought, a cave-in maybe. And then suddenly without will willing it, he was thinking about Martha, the stresses and fractures, the quick collapse, the two of them buried alive under all that weight, dense crushing love. Kneeling, watching the hole, he tried to concentrate on Lee's trunk and the war, all the dangers, but his love was too much for him. He felt paralyzed. He wanted to sleep inside her lungs and breathe her blood and be smothered. He wanted her to be a virgin and not a virgin all at once. He wanted to know her, intimate secrets. Why poetry? Why so sad? Why that grayness in her eyes? Why so alone? Not lonely, just alone, riding her bike across campus or sitting off by herself in the cafeteria, even dancing. She danced alone, and it was the aloneness that filled him with love. He remembered telling her that one, that one evening, how she nodded and looked away, and how later, when he kissed her, she received the kiss without returning it, her eyes wide open, not afraid, not a virgin's eyes, just flat and uninvolved. Lieutenant Cross gazed at the tunnel, but he was not there. He was buried with Martha under the white sand of the Jersey shore. 
They were pressed together and the pebble in his mouth was her tongue. He was smiling. Vaguely, he was aware of how quiet the day was, the sullen patties, yet he could not bring himself to worry about matters of security. He was beyond that. He was just a kid at war, in love. He was 24 years old. He couldn't help it. A few moments later, Lee Strunk crawled out of the tunnel. He came up grinning, filthy, but alive. Lieutenant Cross nodded and closed his eyes while the others clapped, strunk on the back and made jokes about rising from the dead. Worms, Rat Kylie said, right out of the grave, fucking zombie. The men laughed. They all felt great relief. Spook city, said Mitchell Sanders. Lee Strunk made a funny ghost sound, a kind of moaning, yet very happy. And right then, when Strunk made that high, happy moaning sound, when he went, oh, right then, Ted Lavender was shot in the head on his way back from peeing. He lay with his mouth open. The teeth were broken. There was a swollen black bruise under his left eye. The cheekbone was gone. Oh, shit, Rat Kylie said, the guy's dead. The guy is dead, he kept saying, which seemed profound. The guy is dead, I mean, really. The things they carried were determined to some extent by superstition. Lieutenant Cross carried his good luck pebble. Dave Jensen carried a rabbit's foot. Norman Bowker, otherwise a very gentle person, carried a thumb that had been presented to him as a gift by Mitchell Sanders. The thumb was dark brown, rubbery to the touch, and weighed four ounces at most. It had been cut from a BC corpse, a boy of 15 or 16. They'd found him at the bottom of an irrigation ditch, badly burned flies in his mouth and eyes. The boy wore black shorts and sandals. At the time of his death, he had been carrying a pouch of rice, a rifle, and three magazines of ammunition. You want my opinion, Mitchell Sanders said? There's a definite moral here. He put his hand on the dead boy's wrist. He was quiet for the time as if counting a pulse. Then he patted the stomach almost affectionately and used Kiowa's hunting hatchet to remove the thumb. Henry Dobbins asked what the moral was. Moral? You know, moral. Sanders wrapped the thumb in toilet paper and handed it across to Norman Bowker. There was no blood. Smiling, he kicked the boy's head, watched the flies scatter and said, it's like with that old TV show, Paladin. Have gun, we'll travel. Henry Dobbins thought about it. Yeah, well, he finally said, I don't see no moral. There it is, man. Fuck off. They carried USO stationery and pencils and pens. They carried sterno, safety pins, trip flares, signal flares, spools of wire, razor blades, chewing tobacco, liberated jaw sticks and statuettes of the smiling Buddha, candles, grease pencils, the stars and stripes, fingernail clippers, psyops, leaflets, bush hats, bolos, and much more. Twice a week when the resupply choppers came in, they carried hot chow and green mermite cans and large canvas bags filled with ice beer and soda pop. They carried plastic water containers, each with a two gallon capacity. Mitchell Sanders carried a set of starched tiger fatigues for special occasions. Henry Dobbins carried black flag insecticide. Dave Jensen carried empty sandbags that could be filled at night for added protection. Lee Strunk carried tanning lotion. Some things they carried in common. Taking turns, they carried the big PRC-77 scrambler radio, which weighed 30 pounds with its battery. They shared the weight of memory. They took up what others could no longer bear. Often they carried each other, the wounded or weak. They carried infections. They carried chess sets, basketballs, Vietnamese English dictionaries, insignia of rank, bronze stars and purple hearts, plastic cards imprinted with the code of conduct. They carried diseases, among them malaria and dysentery. They carried lice and ringworm and leeches and paddy algae and various rots and molds. They carried the land itself, Vietnam, the place, the soil, a powdery orange red dust that covered their boots and fatigues and faces. They carried the sky. The whole atmosphere, they carried it, the humidity, the monsoons, the stink of fungus and decay, all of it. They carried gravity. They moved like mules. By daylight, they took sniper fire. At night, they were mortared. But it was not battle. It was just the endless march, village to village, without purpose, nothing won or lost. They marched for the sake of the march. They plodded along slowly, dumbly, leaning forward against the heat, 
unthinking, all blood and bone, simple grunts, soldiering with their legs, toiling up the hills and down into the paddies and across the rivers and up again and down, just humping one step and then the next and then another, but no volition, no will, because it was automatic. It was anatomy and the war was entirely a matter of posture and carriage. The hump was everything, a kind of inertia, a kind of emptiness, a dullness of desire and intellect and conscience and hope and human sensibility. Their principles were in their feet. Their calculations were biological. They had no sense of strategy or mission. They searched the villages without knowing what to look for, not carrying, kicking over jars of rice, frisking children and old men and blowing tunnels, sometimes setting fires and sometimes not, then forming up and moving on to the next village, then other villages where it would always be the same. They carried their own lives. The pressures were enormous. In the heat of early afternoon, they would remove their helmets and flak jackets walking bare, which was dangerous, but which helped ease the strain. They would often discard things along the route of march. Purely for comfort, they would throw away rations, blow their claymores and grenades, and no matter, because by nightfall, the res resupply shoppers would arrive with more of the same. Then a day or two later, still more fresh watermelons and crates of ammunition and sunglasses and woolen sweaters. The resources were stunning. Sparklers for the 4th of July, colored eggs for Easter. It was the great American war chest, the fruits of science, the smokestacks, the canneries, the arsenals at Hartford, the Minnesota forests, the machine shops, the vast fields of corn and wheat. They carried like freight trains. They carried it on their backs and shoulders, and for all the ambiguities of Vietnam, all the mysteries and unknowns, there was at least the single abiding certainty that they would never be at a loss for things to carry. After the chopper took lavender away, Lieutenant Jimmy Cross led his men into the village of Tanki. They burned everything. They shot chickens and dogs. They trashed the village well. They called in artillery and watched the wreckage. Then they marched for several hours through the hot afternoon, and then at dusk, while Kiowa explained how Lavender died, Lieutenant Cross found himself trembling. He tried not to cry. With his entrenching tool, which weighed five pounds, he began digging a hole in the earth. He felt shame. He hated himself. He had loved Martha more than his men, and as a consequence, Lavender was now dead, and this was something he would have to carry like a stone in his stomach for the rest of the war. All he could do was dig. He used his entrenching tool like an ax, slashing, feeling both love and hate. And then later, when it was full dark, he sat at the bottom of his foxhole and wept. It went on for a long time. In part, he was grieving for Ted Lavender, but mostly it was for Martha and for himself because she belonged to another world, which was not quite real. And because she was a junior at Mount Sebastian College in New Jersey, a poet and a virgin and uninvolved, and because he realized she did not love him and never would. Like cement, Kiowa whispered in the dark. I swear to God, boom, down, not a word. I've heard this, said Norman Bowker. A pisser, you know, still zipping himself up, zapped while zipping. All right, fine, that's enough. Yeah, but you had to see it. The guy just, I heard, man, cement. So why not shut the fuck up? Kiwa shook his head sadly and glanced over at the hole where Lieutenant Jimmy Cross sat watching the night. The air was thick and wet. A warm, dense fog had settled over the patties, and there was the stillness that precedes rain. After a time, Kiowa sighed. One thing for sure, he said, the Lieutenant's in some deep hurt. I mean, that crying jag, the way he was carrying on, it wasn't fake or anything. It was really heavy-duty hurt. That man, the man cares. Sure, Norman Bowker said. Say what you want, the man does care. We all got problems, not Lavender. No, I guess not, Bowker said. Do me a favor though, shut up. That's a smart Indian, shut up. Shrugging, Kiwa pulled off his boots. He wanted to say more just to lighten up his sleep, but instead he opened his New Testament and arranged it beneath his head as a pillow. The fog made things seem hollow and unattached. He tried not to think about Ted, Ted Lavender, but then he was thinking how fast it was, no drama, down and dead, and that was hard to feel anything except surprise. It seemed unchristian. He wished he could find some great sadness or even anger, 
but the emotion wasn't there and he couldn't make it happen. Mostly he felt pleased to be alive. He liked the smell of the New Testament under his cheek, the leather and ink and paper and glue, whatever the chemicals were. He liked hearing the sounds of night. Even his fatigue, it felt fine, the stiff muscles and the prickly awareness of his own body, a floating feeling. He enjoyed not being dead. Lying there, Kiowa admired Lieutenant Jimmy Cross's capacity for grief. He wanted to share the man's pain. He wanted to care as Jimmy Cross cared. And yet when he closed his eyes, all he could think was boom down. And all he could feel was the pleasure of having his boots off and the fog curling in around him and the damp soil and the Bible smells and the plush comfort of night. After a moment, Norman Bowker sat up in the dark. What the hell, he said. You want to talk? Talk. Tell it to me. Forget it. No, man, go on. One thing I hate, it's a silent Indian. For the most part, they carried themselves with poise, a kind of dignity. Now and then, however, there were times of panic when they squealed or wanted to squeal but couldn't, when they twitched and made moaning sounds and covered their heads and said, dear Jesus, and flopped around on the earth and fired their weapons blindly and cringed and sobbed and begged for the noise to stop and went wild and made stupid promises to themselves and to God and to their mothers and fathers, hoping not to die. In different ways, it happened to all of them. Afterward, when the firing ended, they would blink and peek up. They would touch their bodies, feeling shame, then quickly hiding it. They would force themselves to stand. As if in slow motion, frame by frame, the world would take on the old logic, absolute silence, then the wind, then sunlight, then voices. It was the burden of being alive. Awkwardly, the men would reassemble themselves, first in private, then in groups, becoming soldiers again. They would repair the leaks in their eyes. They would check for casualties, call in dust offs, light cigarettes, try to smile, clear their throats and spit and begin cleaning their weapons. After a time, someone would shake his head and say, no lie, I almost shit my pants. And somebody else would laugh, which meant it was bad, yes, but the guy had obviously not shit his pants. It wasn't that bad. And in any case, nobody would ever do such a thing and then go ahead and talk about it. They would squint into the dense, oppressive sunlight. For a few moments, perhaps, they would fall silent, lighting a joint and tracking its passage from man to man, inhaling, holding in the humiliation. Scary stuff, one of them might say. But then someone else would grin or flick his eyebrows and say, Roger Dodger, almost cut me a new asshole, almost. There were numerous such poses. Some carried themselves with a sort of wistful, wistful resignation, others with pride, or stiff soldierly discipline or good humor or macho zeal. They were afraid of dying, but they were even more afraid to show it. They found jokes to tell. They used a hard vocabulary to contain the terrible softness. Greased, they'd say, oft, lit up, zapped while zipping. It wasn't cruelty, just stage presence. They were actors. When someone died, it wasn't quite dying because in a curious way, it seemed scripted. And because they had their lines mostly memorized, irony mixed with tragedy, and because they called it by other names as if to insist and destroy the reality of death itself. They kicked corpses, they cut off thumbs, they talked grunt lingo, they told stories about Ted Lavender's supply of tranquilizers, how the poor guy didn't feel a thing, how incredibly tranquil he was. There's a moral here, said Mitchell Sanders. They were waiting for Lavender's chopper, smoking the dead man's dope. The moral's pretty obvious, Sanders said and winked. Stay away from drugs. No joke. They'll ruin your day every time. Cute, said Henry Dobbins. Mind blower, get it? Talk about wiggy, nothing left, just blood and brains. They made themselves laugh. There it is, they'd say over and over, there it is, my friend, there it is, as if the repetition itself were an act of poise, a balance between crazy and almost crazy, knowing without going, there it is, which meant to be cool, let it ride, because, oh yeah, man, you can't change what can't be changed, there it is, there is absolutely and positively and fucking well is, they were tough. They carried all the emotional baggage of men who might die, grief, terror, love, longing, these were intangibles, but these were tangible. These were intangibles, but the intangibles had their own mass and specific gravity. They had tangible weight. 
They carried shameful memories. They carried this common secret of cowardice barely restrained, the instinct to run or freeze or hide. And in many respects, this was the heaviest burden of all for it could never be put down. It required perfect balance and perfect posture. They carried their reputations. They carried the soldier's greatest fear, which was the fear of blushing. Men killed and died because they were embarrassed not to. It was what had brought them to the war in the first place. Nothing positive, no dreams of glory or honor just to avoid the blush of dishonor. They died so as not to die of embarrassment. They crawled into tunnels and walked point and advanced under fire. Each morning, despite the unknowns, they made their legs move. They endured, they kept humping. They did not submit to the obvious alternative, which was simply to close the eyes and fall. So easy really, go limp and tumble to the ground and let the muscles unwind and not speak and not budge until your buddies picked you up and lifted you into the chopper that would roar and dip its nose and carry you off the world. A mere matter of falling, yet no one ever fell. It was not courage exactly, the object was not valor. Rather, they were too frightened to be cowards. By and large, they carried these things inside, maintaining the masks of composure. They sneered at sick call. They spoke bitterly about guys who had found release by shooting off their own toes or fingers. Pussies, they'd say, candy asses. It was fierce mocking talk with only a trace of envy or awe, but even so the image played itself out behind their eyes. They imagined the muzzle against flesh. So easy, squeeze the trigger and blow away a toe. They imagined it. They imagined the quick sweet pain then the evacuation to Japan, then a hospital with warm beds and cute geisha nurses, and they dreamed of freedom birds. At night on guard, staring into dark, they were carried away by jumbo jets. They felt the rush of takeoff, gone. They yelled, and then velocity, wings, and engines, a smiling stewardess, but it was more than a plane. It was a real bird, a big sleek silver bird with feathers and talons and high screeching. They were flying. The weights fell off. There was nothing to bear. They laughed and held on tight, feeling the cold slap of wind and altitude, soaring, thinking, it's over. I'm gone. They were naked. They were light and free. It was all lightness, bright and fast and buoyant, light as light, a helium buzz in the brain, a giddy bubbling in the lungs as they were taken up over the clouds and the war beyond duty, beyond gravity and mortification and global entanglements. Sin Loy, they yelled. I'm sorry, motherfuckers, but I'm out of it. I'm goofed. I'm on a space cruise. I'm gone. And it was a restful, unencumbered sensation, just riding the light waves, sailing that big silver freedom bird over the mountains and oceans, over America, over the farms and great sleeping cities and cemeteries and highways and the golden arches of McDonald's. It was, a, it was flight a kind of fleeing, a kind of falling, falling higher and higher, spinning off the edge of the earth and beyond the sun and beyond the vast silent vacuum where there were no burdens, where everything weighed exactly nothing. Gone, they screamed. I'm sorry, but I'm gone. And so at night, not quite dreaming, they gave themselves over to lightness. They were carried, they were purely born. On the morning after Ted Lavender died, First Lieutenant Demi Cross, crouched at the bottom of his foxhole and burned Martha's letters. Then he burned the two photographs. There was a steady rain falling, which made it difficult. But he used heat tabs and sterno to build a small fire, screening it with his body, holding the photographs over the tight blue flame with the tips of his fingers. He realized it was only a gesture, stupid, he thought, sentimental too, but mostly just stupid. Lavender was dead. He couldn't burn the blame. Besides, the letters were in his head, and even now, without photographs, Lieutenant Cross could see Martha playing volleyball in her white gym shorts and yellow t-shirt. He could see her moving in the rain. When the fire died out, Lieutenant Cross pulled his poncho over his shoulders and ate breakfast from a can. There was no great mystery, he decided. In those burned letters, Martha had never mentioned the war except to say, Jimmy, take care of yourself. She wasn't involved. She signed the letters love, but it wasn't love, and all the fine lines and technicalities did not matter. Virginity was no longer an issue. He hated her. Yes, he did. He hated her. Love, too, but it was a hard-hating kind of love. The morning came up wet and blurry. 
Everything seemed part of everything else, the fog and Martha and the deepening rain. He was a soldier after all. Half smiling, Lieutenant Jimmy Cross took out his maps. He shook his head hard as if to clear it, then bent forward and began planning the day's march. In 10 minutes or maybe 20, he would rouse the men and they would pack up and head west where the map showed the country to be green and inviting. They would do what they had always done. The rain might add some weight, but otherwise it would be one more day layered upon all the other days. He was realistic about it. That was, there was that new hardness in his stomach. He loved her, but he hated her. No more fantasies, he told himself. Henceforth, when he thought about Martha, it would be only to think that she belonged elsewhere. He would shut down the daydreams. This was not Mount Sebastian. It was another world where there were no pretty poems or midterm exams, a place where men died because of carelessness and gross stupidity. He was right, boom down, and you were dead, never partly dead. Briefly in the rain, Lieutenant Cross saw Martha's gray eyes gazing back at him. He understood. It was very sad, he thought, the things men carried inside, the things men did or felt they had to do. He almost nodded at her, but didn't. Instead, he went back to his maps. He was now determined to perform his duties firmly and without negli negligence. It wouldn't help Lavender, he knew that, but from this point on, he would comport himself as an officer. He would dispose of his good luck pebble, swallow it maybe, or use Lee Strunk's slingshot, or just drop it along the trail. On the march, he would impose strict field discipline. He would be careful to send out flank security to prevent straggling or bunching up, to keep his troops moving at the proper pace and at the proper interval. He would insist on clean weapons. He would confiscate the remainder of Lavender's dope. Later in the day, perhaps, he would call the men together and speak to them plainly. He would accept the blame for what had happened to Ted Lavender. He would be a man about it. He would look at them, look them in the eyes, keeping his chin level, and he would issue the new SOPs in a calm and personal tone of voice, lieutenant's voice, leaving no room for argument or discussion. Commencing immediately, he'd tell them they would no longer abandon equipment along the route of march. They would police up their acts. They would get their shit together and keep it together and maintain it neatly and in good working order. He would not tolerate laxity. He would show strength, distancing himself. Among the men, there would be grumbling, of course, and maybe worse because their days would seem longer and their loads heavier. But Lieutenant Jimmy Cross reminded himself that his obligation was not to be loved, but to lead. He would dispense with love. It was not, it was not now's, now a factor. And if anyone quarreled or complained, he would simply tighten his lips and arrange his shoulders in the correct command posture. He might give a curt little nod, or he might not. He might just shrug and say, carry on then. They would saddle up and form into a column and move out toward the villages west of Tanki.